The Orion story begins with the detonation of the world's first atomic bomb in the New Mexico desert in July 1945. In the most expensive experiment of all time, scientists have shaped 5,000 pounds of high explosive to squeeze a sphere of plutonium the size of a baseball into an uncontrollable chain reaction of atoms spitting atoms. If it works, the next bomb will be used on Hiroshima. That morning, many strange thoughts went through the minds of the scientists who built the bomb. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I remembered that Sanskrit line. While Oppenheimer thought of death and destruction, Stanislav Ulam, the Polish mathematician, wondered if the immense power of a nuclear explosion could take the first men to the planet. His idea was to have these little explosions propel a rocket into space. Little explosions of atomic bombs. But he certainly liked to dream about that going to the stars. Thirteen years later, Ulam's idea became a top-secret multi-million dollar U.S. government project. At the heart of it was a British mathematics and physics genius, Freeman Dyson. I'd thought of space travel as something that would happen and that I would like to be a part of it. And, but that had always been a sort of vague and theoretical idea. And now suddenly here it became real. It, uh, here was a real project which offered just the kind of things I've been dreaming about. As a child, going into space was something I'd love to do in my lifetime. When he was five, Dyson calculated the number of atoms in the sun. By the age of 25, he'd cracked some of the most intractable problems in theoretical physics and been given a job for life at Princeton alongside Oppenheimer and Einstein. But he found Project Orion irresistible. So the first trip would have been a landing on Mars. The ship would have landed using its bombs. And then about 50 people would pile out and do their stuff. We had thought of it as an analogy of, 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 of the voyage of the Beagle when Darwin made all his great discoveries. Dyson's son George, a science historian, was five years old when he first heard about Project Orion. It was this great romantic part of my father's youth. He never did anything like that again. And at the time, of course, it was tremendously exciting to have a father who was going to build a spaceship. He expected to go along. I remember he asked me once if there would be a little seat beside mine where he could sit and, and things of that kind. So it was always for him a memory of some quite fabulous sort of fairy story that happened when he was little. George returned to the Orion story 40 years later and wrote a book about it, partly to establish the facts, but also as a way to understand his father better. As a teenager, George ran away from home to live in a treehouse on the west coast of Canada. I mean, the simplest explanation is that, you know, son of Freeman Dyson builds 95-foot-high treehouse to escape the shadow of his father, that, you know, it was... My father never built tree houses, so I could have the world's highest tree house even though I was not going to do anything in physics. George earned a living designing and building boats, but his real interest was writing about the history of science. He wrote a seminal account of the evolution of computers before tackling Orion. Writing a book is the way, you know, that's the doorway that sort of leads to the knowledge. That was a way I could devote three years of my life to finding out the story that it had always sort of escaped me. George's research took him across the United States, anxious to trace other surviving members of the Orion team and gather their accounts before it was too late. I'm at a very 
strong disadvantage in that I don't know how much of the project has been declassified. So I may not be able to answer all your questions, <laughs> but uh, gee, I was thrilled when I found out what it was. <laughs> To uncover the true story of Orion, George had to struggle to get key documents declassified. But much remains secret. Even now, his father can't tell George everything he knows. We don't want to give the terrorists instructions for how, and how to build cheap bombs. And that was, of course, one of our purposes. So, so the details of the bombs certainly will be kept secret and should be. George discovered that even Stan Ulam's original memorandum on using atomic bombs to propel rockets is still classified, locked up in a safe at Los Alamos, and the idea might have been forgotten had it not been for what happened in Russia on the evening of October the 4th, 1957. The country went through a very fearful reaction to Sputnik. It gets the American people alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this. And it, we fear this. Sputnik was essentially something the size of a basketball launched in space. And it went around and it beeped. And uh, there it was, and it was obvious that they could, the Russians could make bigger and better things, and they could come roaring over us in orbit. Attention, all those who are in the streets. Run for the nearest shelter, but run as close to the walls of buildings as possible. People were literally uh, frightened, just as they were after 9-11 uh, last year. You know, what is it? What kind of a weapon could it be? Is it a real threat? Does it mean that Russia is going to try to rule the world. So suddenly the Russians had done it, and then, of course, it was obvious that we'd go ahead and do it too. So it was just an enormous window of opportunity that everybody in the government was willing to say yes to all sorts of weird schemes. Of all the post-Sputnik schemes backed by the Eisenhower government, the most audacious by far was Project Orion, run out of General Atomics near San Diego. Its mastermind was Ted Taylor, America's leading atomic bomb designer. Taylor now lives in a nursing home in upstate New York. Project Orion was an attempt to really get realistic about what's needed to get into space to open the door to the scenes that are there all the time, waiting for us to see them up close and personal. To take a peek through one of the large windows and uh, fly under the uh, rings of Saturn, that was unbearably exciting. And that was what our life was about at that time. We really believe we were going to be doing it personally. By the time the Russians put a dog into Earth orbit a month later, Taylor had sold the idea of a nuclear bomb propelled spaceship with a crew of 50 men and women to his boss at General Atomics, the 34 year old physicist and entrepreneur, Frederick de Hoffman. There's only one Fred de Hoffman. It was said that he knew every millionaire in the world. That's probably not true, but I bet he knew every billionaire in the world. He was very good at raising money. A person who wanted results. You, you couldn't fool around if you worked for Fred D. Hoffman. If Orion were to fly, General Atomics would need government backing. De Hoffman and Taylor believed Freeman Dyson could help them get it. Undoubtedly it was true that my name was worth quite a lot because the main problem they had was just to achieve some sort of credibility. If, the, if you just t talked about the project, said you were going to propel a ship with nuclear bombs, and, and most the immediate reaction was, well, this is crazy. The whole thing will blow up, and that will be the end of it. And, and so it, they needed people with solid reputation just in order to have a chance to, to get the thing approved. Of course, the project probably went through his mind in a few minutes. Can we withstand the uh, 
temperatures? Can we withstand the shocks? Can we withstand the accelerations? Can we carry enough people? How big does the ship have to be? And so on. And, and he decided it, it was plausible. And in about 30 seconds of mental calculation, he said, yeah, it'll work. Let's go. The Dysons moved to La Jolla in Southern California. One morning in the end of May, 1958, driving to school, I was told, Daddy's building a spaceship. And when we did go to General Atomic, I thought, I thought they were building the spaceship right there. I thought that big round building was the beginning of the spaceship. George was to find out later that he'd been right about scale. The circular library building at General Atomics was the same diameter as the base of a full-size Orion which would tower 200 feet above it. I can remember very well when Ted Taylor first explained the Orion idea. He said, the nuclear bomb is so strong that if you have a standard size spaceship of the type we were thinking of for chemical propellants, the acceleration that you would have with the force on a small mass would be so large that it would pulverize the uh, spaceship. He said, let's make it big. Let's make it, instead of a few tons, let's make it a few thousand tons. And this means with the same force, you would have much less acceleration. Because it has to be so big, we should change the way we think of spacecraft. Instead of them being designed for the minimum possible weight with just the right strength, which means very fragile for the operation. Let's make it in a standard engineering design, built like the Brooklyn Bridge or a building. Let's make it out of steel, just ordinary steel. And let's make everything aboard it, life support systems, like a hotel. I kept saying we should have a, a conventional store-bought barber's char chair up there just to show how scornful we could be of anything that was up there just to save weight. Taylor and Dyson headhunted some 50 scientists and engineers for the project. Among them Jeremy Bernstein, a physicist at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, where consultants were paid to think the unthinkable. And the Rand Corporation was like a malignant university. It was this faculty all devoted to the Cold War. In the physics division, for example, there was Herman Kahn, who, who was no longer with us, but he was then writing about megadeths and trying to habituate us to the idea that if we only killed a few millions here and there, it would come out all right in the end. It's a gigantic man who clearly had never missed a meal. This whole business of these megadeths and Everybody focused on H-bomb tests and so on, I find rather, found rather depressing. At this very time, the gossip was that uh, Dyson Freeman was in La Jolla. Uh, he had been bitten by a dog and he'd gone to a bullfight and he was working on a, on a spaceship. And so I wrote Freeman a letter and I said, if any of these three things are true, being bitten by a dog or go to a bullfight or work on a spaceship, you're having a better time than I am, I wrote. Well, much to my amazement, a few days later, he called me and said, uh, you should come down here. At that time, a General Atomic was known as Generous Atomics. People had wonderful summers and even winters on the beach in La Jolla. So it was kind of exotic. Restaurants served abalone steak and that sort of thing. You turn to me. De Hoffman's General Atomics was a multi-million dollar company set up after the war to exploit the peaceful power of the atom. De Hoffman had helped plan the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now he was wooing his fellow bomb makers away from the weapons labs to his research Shangri-La. The sun, to us the difference between life and death. It burns, stifles, dehydrates. But who would deny its warmth, its light, its beneficial radiation? So can it be with the energy man has created. The road is open. 
a road which may show us the cure for cancer, a road which may enable us to produce heat and power and new metals with atomic furnaces, new fuels, new ways to nourish the soil and correct vitamin and mineral deficiencies in the very food we eat. This can be our gift to generations yet unborn. We all thought that nuclear energy was a great boon to mankind at that time, and, and we all thought that nuclear energy would, would cure the problems of poverty all over the world, and there were big talk about what nuclear energy would do. And that, of course, was certainly very much a, 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 a driven by this feeling, well, we've used nuclear energy, first of all, for killing people, now let's use it for doing something good. Dyson spent World War II helping to plan the bombing of Germany, and many of the Orion scientists worked on the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. They brought this history with them to Project Orion. I do feel a moral responsibility for the almost 200,000 deaths. I had a small part in it, but still, that's an important ingredient, and uh, that's a responsibility, it's not a regret. There's a difference. Project Orion was a way of doing things in a benign, peaceful way that relied on their previous military experience in some ways. So it was a, a translation of a sword into a plowshare. And I think that's a, a lot of the spirit that, that uh, imbued these people. Nobody really liked this sort of mass murder aspect of bombs. But uh, nevertheless, they loved playing around with bombs. So this was a way of having your cake and eating it too, that uh, you could play around with bombs and still not be killing people, but exploring the, the universe. Nine, eight, seven, six, five. It's one thing to theorize. It's another thing to hear a countdown off a loudspeaker and put on some dark glasses and then all of a sudden to see this pow turn into a pow and rattle and actually break martini glasses that were that were on the uh, shelves of the beach house that was used by the scientists that were there at the end of the day to have their martinis. The Iran spaceship would ride on a wave of atomic explosions, each generating for an instant temperatures many times hotter than the surface of the sun. The original reaction always was, that's absurd. And Ted then told a little story about the tower in New Mexico where they exploded the very first bomb. That tower was, I think, 200 feet high, and on top of it there was the bomb. And you saw the pictures then afterwards of the fireball of the bomb completely enveloping the tower. Everybody had the idea that since the bomb exploded on the tower, the whole tower was vaporized, there was nothing left. But what Ted actually did was he went to the test site, he looked for the pieces of the tower, and he found they were all still there. That every piece of that tower actually is still lying there in the desert. They were thrown considerable distances but they were not vaporized. Tests with high explosive showed that a bomb could push a model Orion without destroying it. This rare film was taken at the Point Loma Naval Test Range by Orion team member Jerry Astell. George Dyson learned that Astell was still living in nearby Solana Beach and that he'd kept Orion relics. Jerry Astell had been recruited by Ted Taylor for his knowledge of explosives. Astell was a Czech resistance fighter specializing in sabotage. Now this is the first model of Project Orion ever built. Astell's experiments simulated the impact of nuclear bombs by detonating half-pound balls of plastic explosive suspended below a steel base plate. This model, or the overgrown fed bullet, 
was actually what we anticipated first our prototype will look like. And we were trying to learn from it what are the pressures alongside the envelope, which will tell us to what kind of loads we have to design that envelope. We were testing shock absorber. What kind of damage will it suffer? And we made many shots, we made many tests, and to everybody's surprise, it didn't look bad at all. It looked like, indeed, you can design structure very easily, which will take all the loads. That the ship is then going to be hit by the debris from this bomb, which is plasma traveling at approximately 300,000 miles an hour. The ship's going to be hit by that. You have to you do that by having a pusher plate, which absorbs the impact from that blast. Then this 1,000 ton steel plate is instantly accelerated to about 1,000 Gs, 1,000 times the acceleration of gravity. Now your challenge becomes, how do you put some kind of shock absorbers between the ship and this plate? It turns out, uh, to everyone's surprise, that when you subject a large plate behind which there is a shock absorbing system to a bomb explosion, that the plate absorbs the bomb materials and is accelerated. The shock absorber moderates that acceleration. And the final product of this is a, an acceleration which, very surprisingly to many people, a human being can tolerate. The momentum that's given to the ship comes in jerks. And so the problem then is how big a jerk can you actually give to a ship without destroying it? And, and that's really the limiting factor for this whole business. You have to calculate what sort of a jerk you can take. So something like 10 meters a second or 30 miles an hour is about the limit. If each bomb can only move you 10 meters a second in, in terms of velocity change. To get into orbit, you need about 10 kilometers per second. So it means you need about a thousand bombs. The key calculation in the Orion project was what would happen to the steel pusher plate when exposed to intense heat and radiation from thousands of nuclear explosions. As the plasma, which is moving you know, at this 300,000 miles an hour, and it's at a temperature of about 100,000 or 10,000 degrees. When it hits the plate and sl stagnates, slows down, it, it heats up, suddenly heats up to this burst of temperatures of the order of 100,000 degrees. What does that do to the steel surface? So the plate will certainly lose a certain amount of material each time, and everything depends on how much. So there's where you have to have mathematics. You have to calculate. and. So if it was, if, 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 if it would remove a thousandth of an inch each time, then we'd know we'd be in very good shape. In 2,000 bombs, you'd, only, you'd lose only two inches. But if it lost a hundredth of an inch each time, then you'd lose 20 inches, and that meant you're probably in very bad shape. The bomb debris is a, a very high temperature fluid which is banging up against the bottom of the ship. So you have to do the hydrodynamics of this flow. You have to do the radiation flow into the solid material. You have to do the evaporation of the material. It was just a whole lot of problems of the kind that I'm good at, the sort of practical problems involving mathematics. In watching Freeman work, I was always impressed that he never seemed to cross anything out. He would just sit there and write this, 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 these, these things, just one after the other, like you're writing to your mother. I, I, I mean, it was just like calligraphy. And I don't know if he ever made mistakes. The theoretical calculations established that the pusher plate would in fact survive. At the test range, the model experiments became more sophisticated, using multiple explosive charges. Freeman Dyson liked to watch. To actually see him out there hanging out with these guys 
playing with high explosives. They could have 400 pounds of C4 without any uh, particular adult supervision. After the flights were over, I picked up these chips from the ground just to keep them as souvenirs. So these are, in fact, the genuine Orion chips. These are just parts of the canister in which the high explosive was contained that blew up. The canister was only needed to hold the high explosive. It didn't play any part in the propelling the ship. And we were lucky that we never got hit by any of these. There is a kind of scientist which I think I belong to, which loves inventing things and then playing around with inventions. And they are very often crazy. I mean, the mad scientist is not just a figure of speech. There really are such people. And they love to f play around with crazy s schemes. And some of them may even be dangerous. And, and so, I mean, the public is not altogether wrong in being a little bit scared of such people. <laughs> We were a bunch of crazies in a certain way, and it was an unusual time when crazy people were actually given a chance to do their stuff. My father had spent his whole life just scribbling on blackboards, and then we moved to California. He was flying this glider off a cliff. I mean, I'd go up on, on Saturdays and watch, and he would get in this thing and be winched right over the edge of this cliff and fly around, and if he did okay, come back. And, and, you know, my dad was doing that. He'd never, I'd never dreamed of him doing anything like that. So it made the whole idea of going into space just seem that much closer. Cars looked like spaceships, and uh, jet planes were flying overhead. They were building Atlas missiles by the hundreds. Orion fit right in. Project Orion was of its time. A time when cars had tail fins but no seat belts and rock and roll was playing on the radio. In Las Vegas, the Mafia were building the casinos and 60 miles away in the Nevada desert, the government was letting off the bombs. Nuclear weapons were uh, very much part of sort of the general consciousness. It was a Cold War situation. The Russians were testing above ground. The British were testing above ground. The French were testing above ground. Everybody and his mother was testing above ground. People thought it was essential to have these weapons and to have a, a large variety of them, which made the whole thing possible because Orion worked on having uh, small, highly efficient, directed nuclear explosions. And if there had not been a Cold War to worry about, who would have spent the money on that? It would take a thousand bombs to lift Orion into space. More bombs would accelerate it to 50,000 miles an hour and still more would be needed to slow it down again for landing on Mars, or wherever. Maybe one of the largest challenges would get the bombs out of the ship in perfect sequence. So two to four times a second, either twice a second or four times a second, you have to eject a bomb from the ship. So that's a great challenge of mechanical engineering. <laughs> We had consulted with some people from the Coca-Cola company because we thought that, that the, the machinery you need for handling 2,000 bombs would be somewhat similar to the machines people use for handling Coca-Cola bottles. They had lots of ideas about how to grab these little bombs and move them down the racks and get them out the ship and bring the next one. You had to be able to select different flavors because if you... Uh, as you went up through the atmosphere, you needed to increase the yield, sort of the opposite of what you would think. And if you had a dud, then the next one had to be a half momentum charge. So you always had to be suddenly, everybody's wanting Coke, and then suddenly somebody wants an orange soda. You've got to be able to grab it and get it in line. 
In the years since Hiroshima, weapon designers like Ted Taylor had developed atomic bombs that could fit into artillery shells. The design details of the Orion bombs are still secret, but Taylor was confident that making them small enough and powerful enough was not a problem. And the final challenge, the easy one, is, okay, how do you actually build the ship? You know, the part where the people live and have their reading room and, you know, groceries and kitchen and all that. And that's sort of the easy part. That's just shipbuilding. The sister company of General Atomic was building the nuclear submarine fleet. So the assumption was that if, if the project really got the go-ahead, probably they would have brought in the submarine people to actually design and build a ship. That the technical problems of building a submarine to go, you know, 500 meters down in the ocean are as bad or worse than the technical problems of building a vehicle for, for the vacuum of space. Certainly it looked much more like a submarine than like an airplane. It was sort of heavy construction with heavy steel full of all kinds of heavy equipment and most of it stainless steel cogwheels and drive shafts and, and a, a lot of just plain old-fashioned rotating machinery. Looking forward to Orion's maiden flight was a test pilot who'd flown every high-performance aircraft in the U.S. Air Force. Like an experimental airplane, it's something, it's there, you, you really want, want to fly it. And looking at Orion, it was the the ultimate dream. It was basically riding a pogo stick and that that was certainly doable. Seven, six, five, four, three. I think it would be the most impressive, most startling, interesting, and in many ways beautiful spectacle caused by action by human beings. We were going to launch from a barge at sea to get away from the neighbors. But um, no, it would have been a very, very loud and very impressive event. It would be, it would be going up from the surface of the ocean, bump, 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 like that, going up, bigger explosion each time. It must be 50 years or so since I heard about Project Orion. I'm sure the idea startled me, this concept of using nuclear bombs, bang, 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 to drive yourself around the solar system. But I don't think I, even then I dismissed it. Every time I get into a motor car, I'm driven around by a series of rapid explosions. Orion isn't a crazy idea even now. It's an ambitious one. But it certainly isn't crazy. The idea is not crazy. It's that the idea that we might do it might be crazy. It'll soon be half a century since Stanley Kubrick wrote to me and said he wanted to make the proverbial good science fiction movie. Well, we were planning to film 2001. Stanley and I thought of using that technology. And it might have been quite spectacular, although I believe that when atomic bombs do go off in space, uh, you don't see a great deal. I think Stanley wanted to avoid the Orion concept because he just made Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, and he felt that having done that, he didn't want to do anything more in connection with atomic bombs. Freeman Dyson, who's uh, one of the few authentic geniuses I've ever met, uh, he wrote a wonderful book called Disturbing the Universe, and uh, he would like to uh, rearrange the solar system and make it nearer to our heart's desire, and, and that is something which I'm sure will happen in the next few centuries. It was something like Mars by 1965 and Saturn by 1970 was the sort of the slogan we went by. 
Establishing human colonies was certainly part of our plan, and not only humans, but of course crop plants and everything else that goes with it. So we wanted to find places which were hospitable to life, and of course for that Mars was the obvious choice. We didn't imagine that you'd go there for the way people talk about it today, going there for a couple of weeks and then coming back. We, th we thought of it says certainly several years to have a chance really to explore the planet. Maybe grow the first crops and then maybe come home or maybe stay there. When Freeman got involved, he very quickly did this study on trips to the satellites of the outer planets where he showed that a little more fuel than going to Mars. You could actually take a longer trip, go all the way to Saturn, stop at one of the moons, refuel with more propellant. That's not nuclear fuel, it's just ice or something to pack around the bomb to, to get momentum to come home and, and come back to Earth four years later. Then the second trip would be to the satellites, which were already then well known to be interesting places. Jupiter has about six, and Saturn has about four big satellites. Each of them could be a habitable world. We know that they have lots of ice and other chemicals that are essential to life. The particular place I was interested in was Enceladus, which is one of the satellites of Saturn. And that was interesting because it has a rather low escape velocity, so it would be easy to land. I mean, the human effort that went into these um, planning studies of trajectories to when was a good time to go to Venus and how you could go to Venus and Mars for just a little more fuel than Mars alone, but then you couldn't stay as long on Mars and you would get bored at Venus, there were no moons. And so all these questions became very real. There's a certain feeling about space and what's in it that is uh, just a big high. Everything that you can think of that people do is different in space from sexual activity to just plain feeling as though you're resting on a cloud. The idea that, that you personally, not getting things ready for somebody else, but going there and doing it yourself. It's unbearably exciting. I always thought Ted was very dreamy. He was thinking of this uh, Queen Mary-like thing which would float around the solar system. I always looked on it a little, a little cynically. I mean, it was fine. I didn't have anything against it. But I wasn't persuaded that this was going to happen. We used to talk about going to uh, these far out, to the edge of the, the edge of our, our solar system, you know, with the Orion. And I used to think that, that was kind of preposterous, I used to think. There was few guys. They were not interested in flying, no matter what it is. If you give them flying carpet, they wouldn't sit on it anyway. Me? Oh, I wanted to go. But my feelings were sort of hurt that, I mean, t Ted was talking about taking his children, and my father said we were going to stay behind, so he was going to go without us. I had just uh, been switching between one wife and another, and, and it wasn't clear what, whether I had any family at all for a while. While the Orioneers dreamed of colonizing Mars and Saturn, in the real world they were being sidelined. The newly formed NASA space agency opted for beating the Russians to the moon using Werner von Braun's chemical-powered rockets, not Orion. It was the first nail in the coffin of the project. NASA, quite rightly, refused to have anything to do with it as long as it was secret. And that's, uh, I mean, it was NASA policy not to have secrets, and I think that was right. As a civilian space agency, they do far better staying out in the open. So that was uh, another of the fatal handicaps we had, that we were kept very tightly secret. 
so instead it went to the Air Force, much to our annoyance. But still, we had to live with the Air Force then from that point on. And the Air Force was quite understanding. They knew this wasn't a military weapon. They were prepared to pay for it because there were lots of people in the Air Force who shared our feelings that it was a great chance to go into space. In the mountains of southern Colorado, George Dyson found two Air Force scientists and Orion supporters called Ed Giller and Don Priquette. Now neighbors in retirement, they were once colleagues at the Air Force Special Weapons Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Giller and Priquette were the key liaison officers for Project Orion. I don't know where Orion got the name, but I'll have to put my two bits in here at the moment. Because it is impulse, an impulse system, we, we call it putt-putt at Kirkland, which the power to be thought we were being a little flippant with. This, theoretically, was a factor of at least a thousand better than anything we had coming down the pike on chemical uh, missiles, rockets. Giller and Priquette liked Orion but there were skeptics in the Air Force top brass who needed to be persuaded to keep funding the research. The liaison officer with the Air Force said, you gotta show them that it'll work. You know, why don't you make a model that flies? The Orioneers built a free-flying model and they made a film for Ted Taylor to take to Washington to show to the disbelievers. After the film, he said there was most marvelous silence you could hear the pin drop because they were all proven wrong and there it was and nobody can argue with it. It worked like a charm. First time we tried it, we think took off like bat out of hell and flew. There's a film that shows this thing going bang, 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 and up it goes a ways. At least that part of it worked. <laughs> One of the things was always to worry about the stability of the system, which that test proved. It managed to give people a little bit of an idea just what this thing would look like. It gave you a real good idea what are these guys trying to do. Paradoxically, this success contained the seeds of Orion's downfall. It inflamed the military imagination in ways that would destroy the project. We were briefing some folks in the Pentagon once, uh, senior military people, colonels from all the services, about how big this payload would be. And in fact, you could put people on it. You could put 150, 200 troops on it. And this is when a Marine colonel popped up and said, that's just what I need to get my division across the Pacific an hour, half an hour into some trouble spot. A trap was looming for the Orion ears. To get the money, it seemed they would have to pretend to turn the plowshare back into a sword and so betray the original peaceful aspirations of Orion. Officially, it had to be justified to the budgeteers as a military program, so they had to invent f fake military requirements for it. I had to name like sort of the six reports I would most like to get declassified. There was a report that on military applications of the Orion vehicle, where apparently they dreamed up all sorts of wild ideas. The sort of colorful one is the doomsday weapon, where you used Orion to launch an enormous, largest physical possible hydrogen bomb that would be left in orbit over the Soviet Union at, at a very high altitude, and then, at the, you know, and then, then in Washington would be the the big red button that, if all else failed, you you pressed that button, and there, you know, there went the Soviet Union. Of course, there also went the the climate of the northern hemisphere or whatever but it was that was seriously looked at nobody thought it was a good idea but the physics was done to determine 
what would happen if you did this. As a military vehicle, of course, it was obviously the, the cat's meow. It could have evolved into something that was like the Death Star with the, it would have had the uh, ability probably to decimate an entire planet. If not decimated, it would make living there hell. The Death Star concept excited the generals at Strategic Air Command, always on the lookout for new ways to enforce peace. As far as the Air, air Force is concerned, it's a weapon system in space. And that was almost a dirty word at those days, a weapon system in space, you know, especially a nuclear one. Thomas Powers, who was uh, second in command of Strategic Air Command, his response was, whoever controls Orion will control the world. And it had to be an American project, and he wanted, you know, to give it the billion-dollar full speed go ahead. General Power ordered General Atomics to make a display model of Orion in full battle dress to show to President Kennedy. This turned out to be a mistake. And there's one model that probably still exists, and someone watching this film may know where it is. Everyone talks about it. And it was the size of a car. And it was a model of this uh, Orion battleship. And it had cassava howitzer, you know, nuclear cannons, and it had uh, 25 megaton missiles that could, you know, destroy half the world, and it could turn around and protect itself by, by, you know, it could hide behind its own pusher plate. The model was shown to President Kennedy and was apparently horrified that this was just the last thing the world needed was, you know, a giant nuclear weapons race in space. It was another nail in the coffin. In the five years since Project Orion began, the world had changed. Concern about radioactive fallout from the bomb tests was turning to outrage. Strontium-90 was turning up in milk and babies' teeth. The public had seen the pictures from Hiroshima, and the Cuban Missile Crisis had brought the world to the brink of nuclear Armageddon. Suddenly, all things atomic were out of fashion. From the beginning of Project Orion, fallout had been among Freeman Dyson's concerns. He wanted to know how much radioactivity each Orion flight would add to the world total. I wanted to know very precisely how many people would this fallout actually harm. And uh, until I knew the answer to that question, I, I certainly wasn't prepared to, to fly in any, in, in, in any, any of these ships and, and or to add to it to approve the project in general. So I made that a high priority myself, to deal with this question of fallout. Well, I did the calculations, and they weren't very encouraging. Every time you took off and, and, and flew off into space, I calculated we would probably kill about somewhere between one and 10 people as a result of radioactive fallout. And that, to me, was unacceptable. And, and uh, so I said always right at the start, well, we've got to clean up the bombs and, 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 and use much cleaner bombs. If we got it down to something like a hundredth of a person, then, then I would consider that acceptable. I mean, it was, a question, it was a question of judgment. You could never do anything, of course, without risk to people. But at least you, it, 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 you didn't want to be sure of killing somebody. By 1963, Dyson's concerns about fallout had become conviction. As a consultant to the International Disarmament Agency, he had to choose between Project Orion and an end to all atmospheric bomb tests. I knew that this test ban treaty that we were negotiating would be the final nail in the coffin of Orion. And still, of course, I said, yes, it should definitely should go ahead. and, and uh, and I remember telling Ted Taylor that I was partly responsible for the test ban treaty. And it, it was so sad for Ted. 
and and in a, in a way, for me, that was I mean, it was it was just obvious by that time that the te te the test ban treaty was right, and that Orion had to give way. We just got the orders to you know shut her down, and uh, that we did, and that ended uh, Orion. I'm totally opposed to any further development of any nuclear explosives, certainly, uh, of any kind, for any purpose, uh, with one exception, and that is Orion. If we were be able to do nuclear testing today, to test it, I, you know, I'm pretty confident that we would get to do it. If I had a lifespan of two or three hundred years, I would give somebody odds that it will be built, that it will be flown. Now let's hope it doesn't suddenly appear in the sky like Sputnik and it belongs to an unfriendly rival. <laughs> the knowledge generated by the Orion scientists is still there, much of it top secret and highly dangerous. A number of the things that were developed in Project Orion are still active military programs. And you can guess that if you talk to people and you'll see what they can talk about and what they can't. You very quickly come to areas that, that still cannot be talked about. And why can't they be talked about? Probably because they're still they're active. We know they're active. There's a great deal of work still going on, particularly with small directed energy nuclear weapons, which you know, have obvious military applications. It could be used to take out deep bunkers where there's only bad people. You can say, well, there's only going to be bad people in these bunkers. Let's use one of these things. That's a very dangerous, tempting thing. If Orion technology could break the taboo on battlefield nuclear weapons, its potential might also be exploited by terrorists. Orion bomb designs use small amounts of expensive plutonium and large amounts of relatively cheap high explosive. And that is exactly the kind of bomb that terrorists would like to make because they have easy access to lots of high explosive, very, very difficult access to fissionable material. So exactly the goal of the Orion physicists, unfortunately, is also the goal of someone, you know, trying to illicitly make a nuclear weapon. So that's that's why that's a secret. So the Orion paradox lives on. On the one hand, nuclear destruction. On the other, nuclear salvation. Some believe that Orion might be the only way to save the world. It may be the best technology to intercept and deflect an Earth-bound asteroid. Some near-Earth object is, is coming and we know it's coming and we have nine months or whatever and we need to divert it and Orion is one of the few existing ways we could do that. We're at risk of the whole planet could be wiped out and it's, it's a mistake to uh, not look at that seriously. Orion provides such an advantage in speed over chemical propellants, uh, that it seems that uh, that interception could take place in a much shorter time scale and consequently the deflection could take place on a, uh, uh, further away so there, it was easier to make such an object uh, miss the earth. Now, I, I, I want to point out that, that um, uh, you know, when I say technical things, they're correct. Generally, people recoil from the notion of using nuclear explosives. I do. I recoil from that notion because I know we don't have that kind of world. And I know that having nuclear explosives in space is inviting someone to misuse them. Even now, the only way we could get large payloads around the solar system is by something like Orion, because atomic bombs contain thousands of times more energy, indeed almost millions of times more energy, than any of the chemicals that we use in our existing rockets, you know, like hydrogen and oxygen, 
they're feeble compared to the energies of an atomic bomb. So when you talk of sending hundreds of tons or even thousands of tons of payload, including human beings, from to Mars, say, that's the only way we could do it, even now. The space age hasn't begun yet. I believe the time will come when very few members of the human race will be able to point to the part of the sky where the Earth is. I'm still very strongly interested in spreading life outside the Earth. Humans, of course, should go along, but the most, I mean, the most important thing to me is just enlarging the, the domain of life. And life has this marvelous adaptability that it's able to adapt itself to almost anything and so it's hardly begun yet, adapting itself to the universe. This little planet doesn't give it so much scope. After Orion, Freeman Dyson went back to Princeton, physics and mathematics. But his dreams of space travel found a distant echo in his son's adventures in the Canadian Northwest. Certainly, the building these kayaks and doing these voyages, that was my way of, of doing what my father had tried to do but had had failed at. It wasn't his failure, it was a failure, I think, on the part of the imagination of the government. Orion did not get the support and go ahead. So I went out on my own, built these kayaks, and did go to these far-off islands that were really like the planets of Jupiter. You could settle on them and refuel. And my boats had these semi-circular sails, just, just like pusher plates, and you sort of coast, which is really what Orion was doing, was sort of surfing on these waves of plasma. In 1965, Freeman Dyson published an impassioned article in the journal Science, entitled Death of a Project. The story of Orion, he wrote, is significant because this is the first time in modern history that a major expansion of human technology has been suppressed for political reasons. But those who've worked on Project Orion must continue to hope that they may see their work bear fruit in their own lifetimes. They cannot lose sight of the dream which fired their imaginations in 1958 and sustained them through the years of struggle afterward. The dream that the bombs which killed and maimed at Nagasaki and Hiroshima may one day open the skies to mankind. <laughs>